Hey everybody, it's Ryan Metzler here again, and today we're going to take a look at a Euro game uh, that I've had for a little while now, and I've gotten to the table several times, uh, and would like to talk about. So we're going to talk about Stouffer Dynasty. Now this is a game from Z-Man Games. Uh, for two to five players, that's going to have kind of a area control mechanism to it, and has a little bit of a unique worker placement style uh, that is pretty interesting. So uh, before I get too much into it, because it's hard to describe without looking at it, let's just open up the box, see how the game plays, and then we'll come back here at the end and get my opinions on Stouffer Dynasty. So here you can see the components for Stouffer Dynasty all set up for a three-player game. Now what we're looking at here is kind of the main player board out here. Uh, some options you'll have when you decide to recruit new guys to your dynasty. Uh, you'll have some cards that can be drafted uh, as part of a reward for picking up some tiles. Uh, and then you're going to have kind of a layout of what's going to happen throughout the round. And we'll focus in on this in a moment. But right now I'd like to focus out on this main board. So the main mechanism of this game is that you're going to be placing workers. So you're going to have a line of workers. These are pre-arranged for the first turn and will be arranged differently for later turns. But each player is going to have, in the three-player game, uh, three workers out here. And the same is true for four or five players. Uh, they'll have three workers out here that are arranged at the start of the game. On a player's turn, they are essentially going to be moving their worker to one or the other side of this track. So you'll see we have two separate tracks here, one here and one here depending on which action they would like to take. So they can take a supply action, which will get them more figures to use, and everybody starts the game with four of their envoys and one noble, but they can get more throughout the game. Uh, and they can also pick up some treasure chests by taking this action, or they're going to be moving a guy to the other side of this track in order to move their figures around the board and try and gain control of various different areas. So real quick, let's, let's outline what happens with those two different actions. So on a player's turn when they take an action, let's say they take a supply action by moving over to the left-hand side of this track. You'll notice that in this case, these guys get placed from the top down. So I would move my guy over as the green player on the top spot of this track. When I do so, I get to take a supply action, and that's going to correspond to this board over here. On this board, I'll just hold it up to make it a little bit easier to see, you'll see that there are four different options. Those options are take, an on, or take a noble and the chests underneath this spot, take two envoys in the chest, take one envoy in the chest, or simply just take the chest. So when this is sitting here, you'll see that there are chests underneath it, and chests that aren't taken from previous rounds will actually stay and more chests will accumulate, so spots will get better. But if you take this spot, uh, if you take this action, you can choose any one of these four, take the appropriate figurines from the little provinces over here, uh, and you will be able to put those into your own supply in order to use in the movement uh, and office taking type of action that is the other side of the track. Correspondingly, you'll also get to take one of these little chests or all of the chests that are underneath that slot. So this could be instant victory points such as this tile here or it could be one of these uh, purple chests that will allow you to spend two purple chests to get an end game victory condition or an in-game uh, in action, I should say. It's either an in-game action or some victory points. Uh, you can take um, one of these, which will let you place into any of the office spaces on the board for a lot less figures, or you can take the brown chests that give you more points as you accumulate them. So the more brown chests you have, the more points you'll get at the end of the game. Now the other side of this action uh, is going to be taking a movement and office securing type of action. So you would place your little family member over here. Uh, if you're in the first spot, you actually get to take a new envoy and add it to your supply. Uh, but then correspondingly, you also get to take an action. And that action is going to be to try and get an office somewhere on this board. Now how this works is you must first move and then you will deploy somebody into an office. Moving always starts with the location of the king, and this is determined uh, in the setup, which will be different each time, or at least one in six times it should be different. But you're going to have to move from wherever the king is in order to off occupy an office space in any one of these six different regions. So what does that mean? Well, each space, each one of these different regions you'd like to move across will cost you one guy to move across. You'll note you start the game with five guys, and you would get one more for placing there, so I would have six. Now, each space I want to bypass will cost me one guy. So if I wanted to move one, two, three to Palermo, I would have to pay one, two, three guys to those different regions, not having to pay to the king's region. Once I arrive in a region, now that I'm in Palermo, I have to occupy one of the office spaces in this area. So we'll see that we have one that costs seven, one that costs six and must be occupied by a noble, 
one that costs five, one that costs four, and one that costs three. Since I only have three guys left, we'll go ahead and say that I had wanted to choose the three spot in this area. When I do this, I must pay three guys, the first of which will occupy this space. So I could, for example, put one of my envoys in there, and then the next two would be paid to the next two corresponding regions, and that would be my payment for that area. I would also get to take the chest underneath that area and add it to my own area, and then that would be the end of my turn. You will of course note that some of these offices cost more than others, and offices that are further to the left in this case, usually costing more, will be tiebreakers for area majority at the end of the round. Also, as I pointed out, some of these will require that you pay with a noble, and the noble occupy that office space. Any space that is occupied by a noble will be worth double in terms of territory control when you go to check control in these areas. So having nobles in spaces is good, uh, and getting the noble only spaces, of course, can be nice because uh, you're placing here, getting your noble out on the board, and you'll have double occupancy for determining majority in that space. After a player has finished their turn by either moving their guy to the movement and occupying office space or moving over to the uh, recruiting, which is called supply area, they're going to go ahead and pass the turn to the next player, who would then have the choice of correspondingly taking a supply action or a move and place action. Uh, and if you place on this side, you'll place at the top. If you place over here, you would place as close to the bottom as possible, building them up. And this is important for turn order later in the game. Now you would keep taking these actions until everyone has had an opportunity to take their actions. And there are some special things that can come up. Of course, the actions of tiles can give you bonuses. For example, instead of having to pay three to place my guy in that office, I would have only had to place one if I discarded this blue tile. Or there are other various blue tiles, for example. This one says that when you're placing in an office, you don't have to pay to do so. There are some that are when you're placing to move, you don't have to do so. Uh, and so there's various different ways that you can cheat the system by having specific tiles. In addition, there are other cards that you can earn, and you earn those cards by getting two of these purple chests and discarding them. So you would return these to the supply, and then you can pick up some of these cards. So, for example, these are worth victory points. You just get pick them up and you would score on the victory point track. And there are several of these that you would use uh, in order to have the game set up appropriately for the right number of players, but the earlier you get to them, the more points they're worth. There are others that, for example, anytime you take a supply action, you will get another envoy. So you could take the basic treasure chest one and get an extra envoy for taking that action. Others say that no matter what office you place in, it always costs you three. So you could place in a seven office and have it only cost three. So various cards that you can earn by picking up treasure chests will modify the way that the game plays. The game will play on with players taking their alternating turns, doing things, of course, and we'll just simulate this real quickly just to kind of show where people ended up placing, whatever happened, doesn't really matter. Uh, but I'd like to show the end of a potential round. So let's just say that the pieces ended up something like this. Now, when you reach the end of a round, you're going to go through several things. The first is that there's always a scoring at the end of the round, and those scorings are based on these tiles over here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the scoring tiles over here to determine how we would score at the end of the first round. So here we can see the scoring tiles set up, and these were set up at the beginning of the game before we started playing. There are five rounds in the game, one, two, three, four, five, in which five of the areas will definitely be scored, as indicated by these first tiles here. These have an A on the back, and so these are the first part that you'll always lay out in this track. And of course, the sixth region is represented, but not in this pile. It's actually where the king starts, so one of these will be left out. So we can see in the first round, Straussburg is going to be scored. And each one of those areas has a little tile on it that is also placed randomly at the start of the game, showing that whoever has majority in offices, so the offices are where you're placing to get majority, will get six points, and whoever has second majority will get four points. Uh, now, this can be broken by uh, furthest left office, and remembering that nobles in an office are worth two for counting majority. So, the second area that's scored, and there will always be two areas scored in every round, is going to be dictated by this second tile. And these second tiles have the letter B on them, so that you know while you're setting it up that these go second. In this case, there are different ways to determine what will be scored. Lots of them will be the king's area, so wherever the king is standing at the start of the round will show you what area you're going to score. And again, you'll score it similarly. In this case, it's Milano, and it would be eight for first and three for second, uh, again, by offices and majority. The last tile here, which is actually labeled D, uh, not sure why not C, I, I guess, I maybe I should think about that, but it's not labeled C, it's labeled D. 
Uh, D tells you how you're going to do the cleanup phase after you've done the scoring. So this is mostly going to be the same. You'll remove all of the people that are in offices that have been scored. So for those two regions that scored, you clear out all of the offices. You'll also go ahead and refill all chests in those areas, as well as all chests underneath the supply track. Uh, now this is not just refilling, it's also adding chests. If chests uh, were left there previously, they will accumulate. And then you're going to move the king a number of spaces shown here, in this case two. So he would move two around the board, which would put him uh, at Augsburg. And when he moves through those areas, the people that have been placed there, not on offices, but in order to pay for movement or to pay for placing people into offices, will clear out and go back to the provinces. And you'll have to acquire them again into your own area in order to play more. These tiles will then go away. And the next round will start again with players placing. And we'll go back to the board to show you how the turn order resets. So after we've finished our scoring, and yes, we would have scored this area here, which nobody is in the offices, but if you had people in the offices, let's say that there was a green and a green, uh, and a red and a red, uh, and that the green here is obviously a noble, but this one is an envoy, and these two reds are clearly envoys, uh, then it would be three to two, and a green would have won, red took second, and then it would have been six points for green and four points for red. Uh, also, we would have ended up scoring Milano because that's where the king had been before he moved, so you would have done the same calculation for the offices there, and all of the guys would have been taken off of these two provinces because the king moved through them. As I said, once we're done with that, the cleanup stage is going to require us to reset the turn order, and the first thing that's going to happen is all of the guys from the supply area will move over, and then secondly, all of the guys from the movement and uh, office placing area will move back over and this will be the new turn so red will get two turns green will get two turns blue will get two turns and so forth and so on now you're gonna play this way for five rounds uh, always of course making sure to restock placing your guys out or getting more guys in order to place out uh, until five rounds are done and at the end of those five rounds there's going to be an end game scoring during that end game scoring which will of course be preceded by the normal regional scoring that you always do you're going to score points for various things one, you'll score points for your chests. So if you had any of these brown chests, you'd look at how many you had and score the appropriate number of points. Secondly, if you have leftover purple or turquoise chests, you'll get one point for each of those. And then you're also going to get points for cards that you started the game with. Each player has dealt three job cards, one of each of three different types. So the first would be an area specific one. This one is specific to the blue area on the board. Uh, so we're looking right out here. And uh, you would look and see if you were first or second in control of that area at the end of the game. If you're first, you would get 12 points. If you're second, you would get six points. And if you're not in the contention for control of that area, you would get no points. Secondly, you're going to have a pattern specific type of placement. So this one is having guys in three different areas that are one space apart. So uh, for each time that you can complete this using different guys, you would get 12 points. So if I had two guys here, two guys here, and two guys here, I would be able to get 24 points out of that tile. So you'll want to replicate that as many times as you can. The third one is going to be a multiple specific type of uh, victory point. So this one is each office that I occupy at the end of the game that is worth three placements. So for example, the one right here, I'm going to check and see how many I have and get an appropriate number of victory points. So as you can see, there's clearly quite a bit to think about here. Really what you're trying to figure out is how you can get a lot of guys from the supply area and then best utilize those guys out on the board in order to score points. Maybe you're going to try and leave people in offices for a long amount of time to score your end game points because you need guys in offices at the end of the game. Maybe you're going to try and force areas to score that you have offices in so you can score points in the game. Maybe you would like to manipulate the rules of how things are going to score. So uh, we didn't look at all of these tiles, but some of them have different ways of determining what the second area to score will be. This one is the one with the maximum number of people in offices. So perhaps you look, want people to stay in one area, so you place a lot of guys in an office in a different area. Or the area that has the minimum number of chests. Maybe you want an area to score, so you place a lot of guys in that area simply to end the scoring, uh, replenish the chests, and, you know, prevent another area from scoring so you can leave your guys there for the end of the game. Regardless, whoever's best able to manipulate this system by placing guys around, holding offices and getting in-game and end-game points is going to be the winner of Stouffer Dynasty. 
Well, there you have it. That is Stouffer Dynasty from Z-Man Games, a game that has a pretty interesting worker placement aspect, uh, and while not the most unique area control aspect, one that I think works very well with the game. Uh, I really like several things about this game. One uh, is the, the worker placement style that it uses, that track with the family members where you can either choose supply or movement and placement, uh, has really kind of an interesting effect on how turn order happens in the future rounds. So uh, if you're early to place on the supply side, you'll be early to play in the next rounds. Whereas if you're early to place on the movement, the area control side of things, you'll be late to place in the future rounds. So you really have to try and balance that in order to have consistent actions uh, in order to try and manipulate for future turns how you'll be able to play your actions because somebody may jump ahead uh, and take the action you want in terms of a, a seat in one of the courts uh, or um, the chest that you want out on the board, whatever it might be. Those chests are also very interesting and I think uh, they bring quite a bit to the game, trying to figure out how you might be able to pick up a chest that will allow you to utilize a smaller number of uh, envoys or nobles to place that on the board uh, really gives you an advantage. So there's some strategy to be had there. Uh, as I said, the area control is not terribly unique, that's, and it doesn't need to be, because I think it has some unique aspects in other areas of the game. It almost feels rondellish with the payment of guys, uh, and trying to figure out how to get more guys, how to best utilize the guys you have, uh, is super important to figuring out how you're going to score points in this game. Also, I like the fact there's a lot of open information at the start of the game as to what areas will be scored in what order, uh, and trying to maintain until the end of the, ga the game to score your different cards uh, that you have for jobs that you get at the start of the game uh, adds a whole nother level of strategy throughout. Uh, so if that sounds good to you, I would definitely suggest checking this one out. Not my favorite area control or worker placement game, but one that combines the two aspects very well. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. Yeah.